So, first of all, thank you so much for the warm welcome. Uh, I'm an enormous fan of this city. The first time I was here, uh, 2002, 17 years ago, I was here on a wine trip, and before I took a very late, like 2 a.m. flight, we got back to the city from wine country around seven, and I went to the casino, and I played poker, and I don't know how to play poker, but I was put at this table with a bunch of 70 and 60 year old Russian dudes, and since I was born in the Soviet Union and speak Russian, something very interesting happened. They saw me as an American boy, and they started talking an enormous amount of shit. So, the night was going on and on and on. I was getting completely destroyed, because when I tell you I don't know how to play, I really don't know how to play. Um, but finally got to like 1 a.m., and they're kind of cleaning house on me, and I've gotta like leave pretty soon and I get some ridiculously decent hand. Um, I go pot committed, I catch something on the final card, and I take all these old fuckers' money, <laughs> and I looked them in dead in the face and basically said, go fuck yourself in Russian, and the look on their faces. <laughs> Two died of a heart attack. <laughs> and literally, that's why I love this city. One, one. Thank you. What up? It's a great outfit. What up, what up, what up? Can't read that sign, but that's a fucking good effort. All right, let's sit, let's go. So, the way I asked to form a, format this talk is mainly to do Q&A, which has worked uh, in Brisbane and Sydney. So, I'm gonna kind of pontificate on a couple things that are currently on my mind. Uh, and I would highly recommend uh, many of you, if you've got a question, to probably start lining up even now. Uh, the mics are right there and right there. Let's talk about a couple things uh, before we get into Q&A. One, I get very fascinated about the concept of this conference in itself. I always spend a lot of time thinking consumer-centric. I always like to reverse engineer. I love to use empathy. I like to eliminate friction. I, I sit backstage and I'm like, okay, why? Why did somebody come today? Why are they here? What, what can I provide that makes this full day investment completely ROI positive? Like what is it that people are looking for? And, and I think a lot about macro and micro. Inevitably, given the course of my career, you know, there may be somebody and a large group of people that are looking for me to give them a tactic. You know, and I'm happy to do that. I can talk at nausea about my deep belief that TikTok is the first social media platform in a very long time that has the potential, if the chips fall properly, to become the next Instagram, and being first is very valuable. This is always a game of being best, but being first is incredibly valuable, and most people are in no culture. 90% of this room, if they're even aware of TikTok, have started with no, because they say that's for 12 year old girls or for my niece or my daughter, my financial service business, my concrete pavement business, my peanut butter direct to consumer business, that's not for TikTok. And that has been the historical huge mistake of businesses because Facebook was for college kids and Instagram was for taking photos and making it better and on and on and on. So I'm thrilled to come here this evening and talk about the tactics or the strategy at the most narrow level of did they take the lights off? That sucks. If you could put the lights back on, I would love that. Um, I'm happy to talk about that. I'm happy to talk to you about the fact that LinkedIn at this moment is acting the most similar to anything that I've seen that looks like Facebook looked in 2011. That it is no longer just business content that if you do makeup or if you wanna do, you know, fitness content or wine content that LinkedIn is now acting in a way, right this second, in a way that will reward you in your execution around whatever you're talking about and that I believe everybody in this conference, everybody should immediately, like tonight, create their TikTok and LinkedIn accounts and spend 20 to 30 hours looking and consuming what content works and immediately, Wednesday, 
start producing three to four pieces of content per platform. I also am highly aware that even though you came for me, your main questions are what's next, where's the opportunity, I've now spent the first four minutes giving it to you, I just gave it to you, and 99% of you will not do anything about it. That revelation over the last half decade for me has led me to all the other places, thank you, it's led me to every other place I've gone. Like, why are you so insecure and concerned about judgment that it stops you from making content? Is your self-esteem so low that only getting five likes on a TikTok post is so scary to you? Why? Why did that happen? How did that happen? And so in my incredible ambition from 2014 and 15 to produce content that was deeply tactical because I have no interest in being a motivational speaker or anything that looks like one, it led me to this place where I stand in 2019 trying to figure out what the fuck you're up to. Like, why won't you take this tactic that I'm giving you? Are you so impatient that you're not willing to spend a year of putting out content on TikTok and LinkedIn to feel the results? Do you believe that there's something called passive income? Do you think there's a hack? Is that what you're about? Are you only interested in the money to flex on Instagram to make other people think you're winning? Like, what? This has been the path that I've been going through. How? How? do I redefine success that doesn't come in the form of watches and private planes and stacks of cash? How do we recognize that the only ambition of this collective room should only be to be happy? How? How does that happen? How do I figure out how to do that? Why are so few people using that as their north star? And that is what's led me into all the heady shit all the insecurity, all the parenting, all the judgment, all the happiness is silent as fuck on social and hate and anger is loud as shit, confusing people what's actually happening in the world. All these dynamics, the anthropology behind human behavior, the fact that we're doing all the same shit we've always done, the fact that social media has changed nobody in this room, it's just exposed you. And so I'm thrilled to give you the fucking keys. I gave it to you in the first 200 seconds of this talk. I, for 20, thanks mom. It's really fucked up. It's really fascinating. My core skill has been to understand where consumers spend their time and attention and figure out what pictures, videos, and written words to put in those pipes. I do it faster than most, which is why I've been able to be successful. I have a 20 year track record from launching an e-commerce wine business in 1996 to email marketing with 90% open rates to Google AdWords for five cents a click to YouTube, to Twitter, to Facebook, to what I'm doing on LinkedIn and TikTok and text messaging right this second. I've given you, literally, I've walked in here and in the first three minutes given you the answer. The answer to the biggest upside for your business or ambition is to make content, as much of it as humanly possible. And make it where people actually pay attention so they become aware of what you want them to know. It always is better if you can find a room that's less noisy and has less people taking that attention. Right this second, right here in Melbourne, at five fucking 13 p.m. or whatever the fucking time it is, the underpriced platforms at scale are TikTok and LinkedIn. It doesn't mean that Instagram and Twitter and YouTube and a podcast and Facebook aren't working. They're actually working remarkably well, but there's a very big difference. They're mature enough now that you actually have to be best, not first. Some of you are capable of being best, especially if you take a step back and start deploying some self-awareness around what kind of communicator are you. Are you good at video? Are you good at written word? Are you good at audio? This is not about being like me. There, you know, I can't write for shit. It took me years until I had enough scale to be able to hire a writer that transcribes my videos into written form for LinkedIn or Medium or things of that nature. You need to figure out how you communicate. But let me promise you this, if you do not produce written words, pictures, and videos for this device, you are fundamentally irrelevant and you are declining in your business opportunity on a second by second basis. 
whether that makes you sad, whether that makes you happy, we are incredibly good at demonizing technology. We're really good at it. We're trying to limit our kids' screen time in a world where they're gonna only live in a digital age. We judge people when they sit at dinner and both have phones and we call that sad without actually understanding those two people actually don't like each other and they're doing what they wanna be doing. We demonize technology. Technology, unfortunately for us, doesn't care about our opinions. It just does. Technology doesn't give a shit. Technology will keep advancing until eventually the robots kill all of us. But for now, there's plenty to do. And for me, the real interesting thing and question and debate and curiosity is why. Why does this room continue to be able to consume my content, hear the same thing over and over? Over and over. More content, more content, more content. And continue every day to not. What? Why? What? I, I, I need that answer from the collective. I got nothing else. I can give you 747 other clever analogies and concepts. This is the easiest game of all time. The reason you know who Muhammad Ali is is not because he was a great boxer. It's because he knew how to hack media. Muhammad Ali's great friendship with Howard Cosell wasn't predicated on a great friendship. It was predicated on the fact that Muhammad Ali was smart as fuck and he understood that television dictated people's minds during that era and that Howard Cosell was the most powerful commentator in that genre. He hacked television. That's why you all know who he is. Yes, he was great in the ring. There was other people that were great in the ring. He's all-time legend because he hacked the attention graft of society of that time. What's crazy was that television, print, and radio had gatekeepers. Somebody had a say, you were good enough to be on the show. What's insane to me is that the internet doesn't care who you are, where you came from, what you look like. It is open for business and it's free. I'm so crippled by the opportunity in front of everybody that it makes me laugh. I'm, I'm literally crippled by the fact that this thing is free and we still find ways to complain. How many people here had a good run on Facebook in 2011, 12, 13? Just raise your hands. Hi, I'm just curious, because it's not gonna be a lot, I know that. So for the 80 people or so that just raised their hands, they knew that the organic reach was crushing it, and then as the platform got bigger and ads started to take over, I pr one more time, raise your hands. Hi. I'm sure every one of you, keep them up for a minute because I want your neighbors to see this, I'm sure every one of you somewhere around 2015, 16 started to get fucking pissed, right? Saying shit's like, Zucks is fucking me. My organic reach is down. The amount of people that complain about Instagram not getting as many likes today as they got 18 months ago because the algorithm's fucking them makes me laugh. It's fucking free. How the fuck is something that's free fuck you? And so I think about this shit every day and I debate with myself, what's the new angle? How do I get it done? The biggest reason I want to do Q&A is I want to go more contextual, not theory. You can watch me pontificate these thoughts on a daily basis for free across all these platforms. I challenge you, my friends, especially the ones that I know for a long time or have seen it before, whether here physically or spent the weekend with me jamming, I challenge you, I challenge you to execute. You can't read about doing push-ups. You have to do them. I'm thrilled to keep giving you a high with my content and make you feel like you're doing something by consuming me, but it's a false passing feeling. Until you start making, you are irrelevant. Until you start making, you are irrelevant. And you will regret. Every person here, which one more time, I'm positive, it's not even a debate, that 98% of you will do nothing with the data I give you today. And the 98% in here in three years who do nothing with the TikTok and LinkedIn advice will regret it. Because everybody will talk about how good it was and how it's starting to decline and how it's not as good as it was in 2019 and 2020. 
everything is being stripped away except for brand. Everything is being stripped away. The internet kills everything in the middle. Your location doesn't mean as much as it used to because everybody gets shit delivered. All your advantages are being commoditized by technology. The only thing that will be left is brand. The only way to build brand is to storytell. The way to storytell in 2019 is not like it was in 1974. It is not print ads. It is not ads in your B2B magazine. It is not television. It is not radio. It is not billboards. It is content on 11 to 12 platforms that are consumed through the mobile device. And it will change. Voice devices are getting close. Next five, 10 years, many of you will buy shit through Alexa. When Alexa dominates the way we buy and you sell peanut butter, you're gonna really wish you bought a brand. Because if I say in my living room, or in my bedroom, or in my kitchen, hey Alexa, send me peanut butter, Amazon's gonna pick what I'm getting. If I say Peter Pan peanut butter, they're gonna have to send that. Everybody here needs to understand that they have to build a brand that comes out of people's mouth, or they will over time continue to lose massive market share. You're mad at the websites that are referral sites now? That's child's play to voice devices. So, this is the world we live in. It's very clear to me what's happening. I'm desperate to figure out why people are not com- creating content. I've come to learn that I've been blessed deeply with incredible parents who gave me enough self-esteem that it's very tough for me to be in a place in my life right now where I overthink posting something because Johnny Pants 49 is gonna say I'm a fuck face. And until I figure out, which I never will, how to disproportionately use the guilt and the gratitude in my body for that framework to over communicate to you of how to get you to produce every single day without worrying about ramifications of people's judgment, I will continue to come on stage, I will continue to produce content, I will continue to make it contextual to the platform that I post on, and I will do that in perpetuity. And so that is what I come here to do. I come here to set a very simple framework, content, at scale. I believe that every person in this room should produce 100 pieces of content for the internet every day. Yep, 100, I know. And there's people here that post like four times a week. 100 a day. Now, how does that come? That comes in the form of 20 tweets that are just written words. Your thoughts, your observations, things you've seen, things you care about, your opinions about your business, your industry, your world. Four, five, six posts on main Instagram accounts. Everyone's so scared to post on their Instagram account now because everyone's using it like it's a fucking museum. Everyone feels so much better in stories because it goes away, but the post you put in your account has to be so curated and looks such the part, and it's your own fucking creative subjective opinion of if it looks good or not. You give no fucks about the community. It's just about how many likes you get. I was looking at all the tweets and all the posts about this talk today, you waiting for me. I looked at your social media accounts. I do it every speech. The amount of people here who desperately want to grow on Instagram yet reply to nobody on their last five posts when people actually reply to the post. There's a reason it's called social media. You post, they say shit, you talk. The audacity of how many likes am I gonna get. Like the sheer non-interest in giving any fucks about your community and only worrying about what's in it for you is the reason you're not winning, is the reason most people don't win. We are in a massively insecure and selfish ecosystem. And I'm trying to break that and bring awareness to it and create a framework of a conversation. That's what I'm up to. So in the spirit of that, I think we should go into Q&A. And instead of me talking, let me do some listening and some answering. So the mics are back there in the corners. Please line up, you're gonna have to line up, sir. Let's get into it. All right, mister, you came with a real fucking outfit. Uh, 
Hi, Gary. My name's Lee, uh, a.k.a. Safe Lee. Yep. Uh, yeah. Outfits for the kids at home. Understood. Uh, what's your take on early age for people to get onto TikTok and social media? I've got an eight-year-old who's heavily addicted. Yep. Uh, his account's currently private. Yep. But he would post literally 40 videos a day. It would be more if he wanted to. Yep. Um, he's worked out the whole, how do I get so many likes? Because uh, it's accumulative on TikTok, so he can see that figure, and he's figured out that if he does 40 videos and five people like each one, he gets 200 likes a day, so he's very happy with it. He's his... learning math. Yeah, he loves math. Yeah, yeah, it's great. It's, uh... So I'm just interested in your take on... <sighs> My take is I have a lot of passions about parenting, but I have zero interest in telling any individual how to parent their kids. I think one of the wildest thing to see is people give parenting advice to other parents. What I would say is this evolution. You and I are part of a generation that saw video games come into culture and every parent tried to limit kids on video games and now and make them play sports and now the biggest checks in the world over the next decade are going to be for esports stars not athletes of other sports. What I would say for every parent is please play chess. Today is not the world your eight-year-old is going to live in. Do you understand how different the world is gonna look in 15 years? 15 years ago, nothing we talk about existed. Not the iPhone, not Facebook, not YouTube, not Twitter, not Insta, I mean, Jesus. In the last 15 years. How many people here are over the age of 40? Raise your hands. 25% of this room remembers the world pre-internet itself. I grew up the first 18 years of my life without the internet. Like, so what I would say to you is, you, knew, you know your kid, you need to understand, but there's a lot of good happening yeah. on that screen time, and the question is, what else would they be doing? Watching TV? Playing video games? Like, th th you know, this, this fascination that every kid is gonna be so healthy and eat well and play outside all day and study is fucking ludicrous. Yeah, well, he doesn't, he doesn't watch normal television. Nobody they fucking watches normal doesn't, television. Doesn't do anything, like, they all watch stuff when they want. And of then he course. complains about when he can't, when he watches normal TV. Because it's, it's fucking like, 2019, <laughs> yeah. not 1980 fucking nine. Yeah. Uh, so my answer is watch him and listen. Yeah. But don't demonize technology because every other parent is. Yeah, thank you. Cheers. Thank you. Hey, bro. Hey, brother. Dude, I was so excited to see you in person. Don't tell everyone else here, but I actually left this event to stalk you on Instagram, try to find you, but... Um, anyway, so, <laughs> I, I, was at the, I was at the sports card store. Yeah, I was trying to find you, I was too late. Anyway, Nonetheless. Um, so I've literally had a thousand business questions I could ask you, but um, the thing I'm focusing right now on is learning and trying new things Yes. and um, working on my mindset. And so one of the things you say is to get close to the people you want to learn from. Yes. And so I want to ask a question, not just for myself, but something other young people will also get value from is, I saw a um, talk you did with your interns in 2018, but what you said was, all of you are here because you know some wizard who knows me and is close to me. Yes. So how would someone who doesn't know someone like that get an internship at Vayner? Find somebody that knows me. <laughs> it's the truth, it's, it's, it's human nature, right? Like. You know, we get 50 trillion people that want to be interns at Boehner, and the reality is every, every year there are people who I have long relationships with who are dear friends and family members who are calling in favors, and a nice percentage of our interns are that, but a nice percentage isn't. However, you're thinking about it the wrong way. I spent zero minutes except for that talk with my interns this year. See, the way to do it is to ma map those 100 people that you want to be with or like and then be willing to eat shit. I am, man. I, I just moved to Melbourne this year, and seeing you live in person has already made it worth it. Thank you. But basically, yeah, like, I'm... I, I think you it. ask questions to get the coffee, or you pay attention to what she or he needs and offer to do it. A level of massive humility to just get as close to P. Diddy or Sarah Blakely or whoever you want to be like I think works, and like for example, right now if you were to ask me, the answer would be no because I've got too much around me right now, but maybe in seven months it would be yes. It's being comfortable with getting a ton of no's. I watch people ask, 
you know, they've heard this before. You've heard this from me before. They asked like two people and they, then they sent me an email like, you had bad advice. I'm like, and I'm curious. I'm like, how many people did you ask? Four. I'm like, how many times? Once. I'm like, you're a fucking loser. <laughs> you want it so bad and you sent four emails and you gave up, you fucking piece of shit? So that's what I think. Dude, I'll keep asking. Uh, yeah. This video will, You're welcome. will be there. Yeah. D-Rock, how many times did you email me to offer me to make a free video? D-Rock emailed me five times before I even replied. And then when I said yes, I think it took a long time. Yeah, I mean, it's just a fucking, everybody talks about them wanting it so bad and they give up after like a bullshit effort. If you fucking want it so bad, it's about, it's the same thing with startups and entrepreneurship. Everybody, wa- guys, do you know how hard it is to be an entrepreneur? Think about what you're asking for. You want to live your life on your terms. The way we define entrepreneur right now is real wealth. You want to live a 0.1% life. Of course it should be fucking hard. People are soft. My man. Hi. Uh, hey. Hi, my name's Sean I'm from Melbourne. Um, how, how's it going? Really well. Welcome to Melbourne. Thank you. Um, my question's about virtual reality and esports. Okay. So I found you a week ago. And Thank you. And basically, I think I'll never have to come to another thing like this because <laughs> you've, you've converted me, all right? You've unlocked something. Um, I've just started a podcast called Virtually Play- Playable, and it's to support the developers out there who are creating content for virtual reality. Um, so I'm already putting into action what you've recommended. Love. Um, my question is about virtual reality as a platform and also like esports. Uh, you, you've said that you're interested in nostalgic brands like yes. Nintendo. Yes. But my belief is that the Nintendo of tomorrow is being born today. I so, believe that too. And they both and they both and they both coexist. I believe to your point that 35 years from now, whatever we're doing, that both Fortnite and Zelda can coexist. You know, yes, nostalgia is being born every day but it also is not dying necessarily, right? So there's a place for Pokemon and Mickey Mouse today, right? So I believe that. I think the bigger and more interesting question for me is how patient are you? We are a long way away for virtual reality at scale at the consumer level. There's not a person in this huge hall or this gorgeous city that spends an hour a day in VR. It's just not there yet. The technology is moving very quickly. And so it's just like internet, right? Microsoft had Microsoft.com in 1991. It really didn't matter until 1999. So your biggest thought to make what you're doing practical is either A, you get subsidized by B2B because going to the footy championship in September and a brand having a VR thing there, that could even happen this September. But normal humans, us playing VR games or doing anything VR is super far away because we haven't even started. So that's, that's what you have to debate. Because right. timing matters. Sure. Right? Like text messaging. Right now I'm obsessed. I've been waiting for text messaging for 15 years. I've been waiting to get into your text and sell to you for my whole life. Now is the time. It's just starting to happen, right? Back to gaming, Ninja just a couple hours ago announced his cell number to get people into his, so it's just happening. Got it? Awesome, cheers. Hey, how you going? Really well. Uh, This question's about the music industry. So I run music studios, I run a record label, manage an artist. Uh, We've just left our ties with a major label because of the way the, their approach to releasing content. Of course. Um, what's your thoughts on how much merit in there is the old school way of what the labels do? Cool. Uh, second question then, that basically confirms what I was thinking. Um, can I drop you an email introducing this artist to you? I'm sorry, my friend? Can I drop you an email introducing an artist to you? I would love that. Perfect, we who do, do I send it to? Gary at VaynerMedia. And I'd also grab DRock, he's running around. He curates Perfect. a lot of the music we use in content. Done, sounds awesome. good, thank you. Good luck. Hey dude, um, Jordan Crawley here. Uh, I've been watching you since about 2015, and uh, it, I guess this could be the first episode of Answer Gary V. Because uh, <laughs> in answer to your question, I think the reason that I personally didn't post and all of that, I guess in some 
respect, I did give a shit about what people thought of me, you know, like you... Of course. <coughs> you kind of go along and you think, oh, you know, my beard can kind of go Your upside down. Your beard's fucking amazing. Yeah, but sometimes it isn't. It looks like shit. It's Fuck like up them. <laughs> yeah, right? So, so to uh, listen to what you say, you know, I think it's finally really clicked for me this year that um, it's, it's time to do a podcast. I've identified that I'm pretty good on video. I'm, I'm an actor on the side as well. Nice. But, but I'm also in business and, and I want to try and bring value as much as I can, just like you recommend. And then I'll cut that down, like Understood. you say, and yep. contextually market it. I, and I real quick, I'm going to just bring value. For me, podcast is a holy grail because you get three things. You do the podcast, you've got a podcast. You film it, and now you have a ton of content that you can use in all these different platforms. Number three, you have a guest on, and you can siphon her or his audience because their fan base is gonna listen to the podcast. So it's got a triple threat to it. I couldn't push you more to start a podcast. Totally, and, and, and I, I guess it took a while to get into my thick skull that that was the way to do it, but you've been saying that for years, so I really appreciate that tip. Thank that, you. that actually really does help, man, and you're a fucking smart dude, bro. You, your execution is awesome, your hustle is amazing, and I love where your mind goes to, and I know how you interrupt quite a lot of times, yes. but, but you do it because you know the value of what you're about to say is going to bring it more to the person than what it's, they're about to I say. I appreciate you're not rude. You, know, you know what's funny? It's not even that audacious. The reason I suck at interviewing people and everybody wants a punch me in the mouth when I have guests on is actually twofold. One, I'm so hard schedule that I have to get it done in yeah. a certain period of time and we don't post produce. We don't clean up anything. Yeah, yeah. And I have a disease, which is my gift, which is I know what the fuck people are going to say before they're done with the sentence. Yeah. And so I'm thinking that I want to get as much out of this person for the audience. And so I'm willing to take the heat that I'm a jerk to get more value out of the person, not from what I'm gonna say. And so that's kind of how I think about it. Yeah, so my question is, um, Interesting, right? y you're big on contextualizing or con uh, context, uh, and, and when you're looking at uh, Musical.ly, or what's it called now? TikTok. Mus TikTok, sorry, no problem. and, and uh, LinkedIn, what do you think about the psychology in regards to your marketing to the market, and, and, and how should you behave? As you know, Instagram and Facebook So different. TikTok, I think about it being a young community. Right, it's yeah. young, and so I'm thinking about that. Or it's the parents of young because they're watching that. So I'm, I'm thinking about what they're doing in there. It's entertainment oriented, it's music oriented. So those are the things I'm thinking about. And then I'm looking for memes, right? One of the things that's exploding on TikTok right now is filming your phone with content of you on a different platform and you doing something with that. So I started filming my keynotes and talking to the TikTok community over it. So I'm looking for nuances and psychology. LinkedIn is a business crowd, so all of a sudden if I'm selling makeup, I'm thinking five tips of how to get your makeup ready in three, you know, in three minutes yeah. or while you're at the airport. Or, so I'm always reverse engineering the thought process of them in their feed. Because you and I are different when we're looking at Twitter than when we're looking at Instagram than we're looking at YouTube. The psychology is different. Obviously you've picked up on that. Yeah. So that's all I'm doing. And I'm yeah. testing and learning and I don't think I have to be right. I'm just putting out so much content that the quantity is helping me to get to higher quality. Most people think you're giving up quality when you do quantity. It's only because they're stuck in a philosophical debate. I'm fucking yeah. actually out here making. Would it be fair to say that uh, TikTok's like the McDonald's approach where you get, get the Happy Meal in the playground and you have customers for life and then the, the, the LinkedIn approach is a bit more professional and where we're getting caught up is we're trying to be too professional Probably. rather than... I think, both those, I think both those analogies work other than by the time those TikTok kids grow up, you might not be selling them at a McDonald's. You might have grown up and opened a three-star restaurant Yeah, because they may not be there anymore. Yeah. Right? MySpace is not here anymore. Yeah. Can Got I get it? a photo, dude? Sure. Thank you. Thanks, guys. All right. Hi, Gary. What's up? All good. So, yeah, I was the one who, signed, who gave this sign to you. It's actually said... Teach me about life, okay. business sensei. So you're keeping it simple. <laughs> I want to own it all. Yeah. Go, so, go to the mic. I can't hear you. Oh, all right. So in my, go my goal in life is to own it all, just like what I have in this cap. <laughs> so I'm a 22-year-old kid. Okay. Uh, I'm still in uh, medical school right now. Okay. It was, um, yeah, it was kind of hard because I don't actually want to be in medical school. <laughs> 
so don't. Uh, but I can quit. I'm already in my third year. I got Why two. Why not? Huh? Well, if I quit now, I won't get any degree. Are and you, you going to be a doctor? Huh? Are you going to be a doctor? Well, actually, my, I don't want to be a doctor. I want to be a hospital owner. For me, being a doctor is like being an employee. Okay. And for me, being an employee is not something in my blood. <laughs> so I why, cannot be told. So why are you finishing medical school? Um, it's because I was, at that time, I was good at biology. Who and gives I, a fuck? I, I, no, I, I mean, when I was in high school, I was pretty good at biology. I'm not talking about last year. No, no, no. I'm talking about why are you going to spend the next two and a half years of your life doing something that you fully believe has nothing to do with what you want to do with your life? Well, Other than appeasing your parents, it makes no sense. Yeah, I know, but like, I already talked to my parents Let about Let me promise it. you the easiest way to not have it all hmm. is to not understand why you do shit. Okay. Yeah, right. well, if you ask me why I do it right now, I just want to, I just think that it could be a good kind of like springboard for me in the future. As a, if I get the name of a doctor. <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay, so uh, in my opinion, <laughs> sorry if I make you confused. But, no, no, I'm not confused. Uh, I think you're confused. <laughs> yeah, I am. That's why I asked you the question. Well, that's why I'm here. I'm fucking listening. <laughs> yeah, here. <laughs> I'm trying to help. <laughs> Sorry for being like, no, no, you're being, aw you're being awesome. What I'm doing is desperately trying to help you have a conversation with yourself. All right. Because you're pulling from, you're half pregnant. <laughs> All right. Right? <laughs> you, you know, I, I'm, I'm worried about somebody who's pontificating with a hat of saying, I want it all. Yeah. Because you're talking real macro and gray. Yeah. But you're going so micro and black and white. Yeah. Which is okay. I want you to just be self aware about that. Because there's so many people like you that are actually going quite conservative and playing defense, but talking about offense. And I think that creates a very tough struggle within somebody. Yeah, actually, that's true. I mean, no shit. Yeah, I mean, I want to play the offense, but... Like, You're playing defense. Yeah, I could. Um, I want to play the offense, but my, like, I don't know, my mentality s said, look, if you play the offense, and then when you, do the, when you did it, like, you're going to get interventions every single time. Like, for example, I, did, I decided on myself that I want to do a martial art class. Okay. Because it's, uh, I believe for, that it's good for my... Uh, body okay. for strength and yep. also like to focus. Okay. And then when I did it, my par uh, I did a sparring class, which is which is normal like in martial art class. Yep. I got hurt, okay. and when I go home, my parents told me, "What do, what do you get hurt?" I was like, "Well, I'm not good enough, so <laughs> stop going to the martial art class." And I was like telling my parents, "Don't do that." Well, I'll just take out the, your uh, your your bank account, and you know. You, you can't do your martial art class anymore. So, yeah, so look, what the story... What do you think should I do? I yeah. think you should stop relying on your parents. All right. Yeah. Parents who pay for things have control. All right. Parents who don't pay for things have no control. You're living within the framework of your parents. There's nothing wrong with that. It just ends up bad quite often. Yeah. That's what, like, I'm trying to get away from them. Stop taking their money. Yeah, in a way. No, no. <laughs> I'm going to make it very simple for you. Yeah. Don't take their money ever again. Okay. Like, I want to I start to do that. And when, when I tell you that if you never take their money again, that you will have obnoxious level of happiness and freedom, it would break your fucking face if you knew how much. Hmm. Get off the payroll. Yeah. Thank you, bro. You're welcome. Hey, Gary. Yo. Ooh, that was a bit loud. <laughs> so, my name is Zach, and I'm just gonna start and say, I'm slightly nervous and I need to pee, but <laughs> first and foremost, Consuming your content 
really changed my perspective on life. Thank you. And I've finally figured out how to be happy and at peace regardless of where I am at life. So thank you for that. <laughs> now, getting on to my question. So, from consuming your content, it inspired me to start my own podcast called Running From Comfort. And I've had guests on, and I won't lie, it kind of fucking sucks at the moment, but I'm dealing with the fact that it sucks because it will get better. <laughs> of course it will. We suck at everything. You know how bad we were at driving the first year? Mm. Like bad. Oh, my dad used to like literally skits out <laughs> so, how bad my driving so was. So of course it's going to be bad at first. Keep but going. But anyways, um, a few of the people I've interviewed on there, they're entrepreneurs and their whole business is based on social media. Okay. And I asked them the question... Um, how has social media affected like your life in terms of like your personal relationships and potentially your mental health? And I've had two people say that um, it's actually negatively affected their mental health. They've had to find ways to manage that. So I want to ask you, because you are the king of content, you spend a lot of time on social media, you're posting all the time. Is there any way that you sort of disconnect from the social media world for your mental health or do you find it doesn't affect you negatively? Um, it doesn't affect me negatively. I don't disconnect from it on purpose in any shape or form because what I completely believe and understand to be true is that social media exposes us, it doesn't change us. The two people that told you it's been a negative don't realize that they were in a negative place prior to it and if it was never invented, they were insecure and broken before it. And one more, just quickly. Real quick on this, everybody who's blaming social for FOMO, we see every, everybody who's blaming social media for making us bad, Facebook didn't make you write a thing, single thing. You wrote it. This is exposing us. So if you're the kind of person that lays in bed on a Friday night at 9.30, goes through a feed, and sees your best friends at a party, and that fucks with you, you were insecure. Instagram didn't make you insecure. Your DNA, parenting, and environment made you insecure. This is speeding up the process of exposing us, which will lead to much better conversations. Social media is being demonized because we hate to be held accountable. Sure. Now, quickly. About a year ago, I wrote you down as my dream guest my podcast. So will you come on, and how do I hook that up? Nope. <laughs> however, however, if you email me a year from today and in the title put, I was the guy who asked the insecure question of the two people, I asked you to be on the podcast, you said nope, you told me to email in a year. If you email me a year from today with all that information, then the answer is yes. I'm holding you to that. I will deliver. Hey, Hey. hey Gary, sorry a bit nervous. First of all, thank you so much for replying to my DMs just happy, before. Happy to do it. <laughs> and I asked you what the very first person asked you if there is any internship opportunities. Nope. But I've got the answer now. <laughs> um, just a quick one. So I just started working in marketing automation okay. in B2B okay. on Marketer. Okay. So I just want to get your thoughts on where you think it's going and how, I can, how can I do it better. Well, I think automation and technology is amazing, but I think it gets you to a place where humans still need to be involved. I think people often think about AI or ML or things of that nature and think it eliminates humans, and I think what it does is it eliminates things that humans are wasting their time on. And right. so I think you could do it better by understanding the mix of humans and technology. Awesome. Yep, that's it. Thank you Thanks. so much. You're welcome. How are you, Gary? Super duper. Um, You're right. I run multiple social media accounts. Okay. And do you think that a lot of people benefit from rapid testing different products across them to find their niche in them? I think at some level, yeah. yeah. I, I love speed. Yeah. And if you have a bunch of different accounts and you're trying to sell chocolate or T-shirts or, yeah. you know, racing gear. You know, I don't think there's anything wrong. You know, what you need to be careful of is that the audience starts to check out because you're spamming them too much. Yeah. So you have to find the right cadence of rapid learning um, to not lose organic reach out of lack of trust from the content you put out. 
but for the most part, I like the thesis. Yeah, and how would you diversify your audience to different platforms? By changing the content. Yeah, okay. No worries, right? I appreciate My it. You know, and I'm gonna use this moment to, you know, so many muscle dudes and bikini girls say the same thing to me, which is like, hey, like I really wanna talk about vegan lifestyle, but every time I do, I get no likes, and every time I put out a bikini shot, I get a billion likes. And I'm like, but you wanna talk about vegan lifestyle? They're like, yeah. I'm like, so put out vegan lifestyle for a year and eventually you'll get more likes. People are so caught up by the machine that they care more about likes than their own happiness. That's true. That's my answer to you. No worries, I appreciate that. You got Thank it. You. Hey Gary, how are you going? How are you? Good, real um, good. My name's Sani and I just wanna take a moment to uh, thank you for your content. Um, also, it helps people that who aren't interested in business and entrepreneurship as well. I've had That's people, I've had friends with mental health issues, and I've said to them, "Look, I know you can't get out of bed today. Just watch a couple of videos, and it's actually helped them so, so much." So, thank you. Thank you. Um, my question is about um, the relationship between the entrepreneur and the creative. Okay. Um, what should a natural-born creative look for in an entrepreneurial partner, and what do you Humility. look for? Humility? Yep. Humility. And the other half of that question is, what do you look for in a creative? Humility. Same. Yep. Same. Because it takes humility to feed creativity. If I, as an owner, think my opinion of the picture or video you made is right and need to give you so much feedback before it goes out, that's my own ego and insecurity slowing down the process we need to find right, not be right. And that's based on humility. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thanks. G'day Gary, how you doing Mike? Doing well, how are you? Very good, thank you. Now, first of all, I'm starting a startup, Kindness on a Plate. This is a vegan meals business. My question to you is that as a business owner, or starting up a business, I want to make decisions, which I am, because I know there is no other way to start a business. Yes. The question is that how do you make level-headed decisions all the time? And if you do, first of all, and if you, if I, you do, how I, do you? I feel historically I've been really good at it because I'm completely unemotional. Mm -hmm. It's and, business. Okay, well then probably it answers the next part of my question that if the decision you make doesn't turn out to be the right decision. I move on. How do you move on? Like, how do you not dwell By on not that? By not overjudging myself. Okay. All right. Well, that's good. Thank you. I and mean, and let's play it out. Like, what, are you going to beat up yourself the rest of the year? Yeah. Like, no. to me, life is about alternatives. I make decisions super fast. I make decisions because the speed of the decision is more valuable than the debate. Because if I'm right, I'm right. And if I'm wrong, who gives a fuck? I'm not sitting, I'm sitting up here as a byproduct of getting Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Instagram, Snapchat, LinkedIn right. I spent a lot of time on Peach, on Social Cam, on Vero, on Vidler. Those didn't work out. When you make decisions and you don't dwell, the net outpaces. Everybody here is trying to, in the world, what you're asking is you're trying to be three for three, right? You want to be three and oh. Three right decisions, no wrong decisions. I'm trying to be 118 to 92. Got it? No. Let me explain. Everybody's looking for perfection because perfection is a disguise of insecurity. I'm just doing because I'm not worried about the ramifications. As long as you're not dead or out of business, no mistake is a big deal. Where this goes is people being worried about judgment. See, I like it best when things look bad. I'm a wartime general in a world of peacetime generals. That's an entrepreneur. That's why I'm scared people are getting into this when they're not. You starting a business with that being the top concern is a humongous vulnerability. Doesn't mean you can't get over it. I'm just trying to make sure during this era of everybody being a fucking entrepreneur, that entrepreneurs 
need to really communicate what it's about so that other people don't just go into it because it looks good because it's really hard to be a zebra when you're a fucking penguin. Yep. Cool, thank you. And two more questions. One, I'm pretty sure you'll say yes to. Can I have a picture? Okay. Thank you. And secondly, my business motto is because the lifestyle, vegan lifestyle you talked about earlier, I'm trying to change perceptions of the world about what vegan food is about. You don't have to do that by building a business that sells vegan food. No, but the thing is, what I'm trying to create flavors and the taste which you are used to as a meat eater, but in a different way. So That's cool. How can I send you that meal so that you can taste it? Um, you can send me the picture of you and me right now to Gary at Vayner Media, and we'll give you the address, then I'll taste it. Thank you. You're welcome. Can I take a picture? You can. Hey, I'm Rebecca. Uh, I work in people and culture, and uh, my question is, so I'm really passionate about empowering people to envision what's possible and help ignite their spark. Okay. Uh, so my question to you is, what would you say to anyone who feels like they don't know what they are, um, who they are, um, and is struggling to find what they're passionate about? Usually I would tell them that their insecurity or their, you. you know, lack of being able to find it is predicated on fear, which was instilled to them by somebody else, and that they need to reconcile that before they can start looking forward. Most people, like this is one big thing, like this is, I'm giving the same answer over and over. This is completely predicated on fear and being worried that you're judged. 99% of this hall is still in fucking high school. The reason most people don't know who they are is they haven't tried. The reason they haven't tried is they're worried what people are gonna say. I would tell them to tell their mother to go fuck themselves. <laughs> or their father, or their sister, or their spouse, or their fucking miserable best friend that they need to start cutting out some of the time they spend with them. Cut out negativity, that's what I would tell them. Awesome. Cool. Can I get a photo as well? Sure. <laughs> Gary motherfucking V! What up, baby? Damn. All right, you said how hip hop rules the world. I believe it. Now, I've seen, and many people in the music industry have seen rap, rap game change in Australia. New, there's a new market for, for people coming up. And pretty much my question was, with the middleman being cut out, with the internet exposing everyone, is there a specific truth to focus on when podcasting, producing content, etc.? Yes, the truth. In it's the, interesting, the way you asked the question. If you used a different I, word, you happen to use truth, but no matter what you would have asked, the answer is gonna be the truth. When you story tell, which is what music's about, it's unbelievably obvious there's a reason most artists' first album always over-index. It's their life's truth if they write. Got it? Yeah, they come up. They come and up. they come up. And as you know, the reason the second album is a struggle is now they've made it, and the only thing in that two years they can write about is now the floss of it. What a lot of them don't want to do that, and so they start stretching the truth, guessing the truth is your answer. In addition to that, what would you provide any advice for any artist managers out there? To force their artists to put out content. You know where I sit on this. 365 days a year on SoundCloud and Spotify. 365. If you're capable. It sucks that Prince died and there was a shitload of music in that vault. You know, like I wish that music made it out. We live in the internet now. Put out the fucking music. Done, easy. You got it. Hi Gary, how's it going? Really well. Ah, whoa, whoa, let's get closer. Uh, my name's Reese. Um, so I'm a videographer and photographer. And from a brand perspective, what do you look for outside of humility in a content creator? So if you were looking to outsource more, if that makes I, sense. I don't make that call usually because I don't really overthink it. Yep. You know, I don't really know how to look for somebody that's great at finding angles or knows how, you know, it's not my skill set. So what I look for is tenacity and, and just serendipity, but that might be a much better question to D-Rock of what he looks for. Like for me, I think creative is subjective. And so I'm, I'm, I'm not really looking for much to be honest. I really am not. Yeah, cool. And 
with that then, from looking at other brands, what would you give as advice for other brands in terms of getting a creative? Most other people, I think, have an opinion that they enjoy having the power of that subjective call. So I, for brands, I would tell them to deploy far more humility and let the audience have an impact, not their own selves. For creators, I would say look for people that like what you do and just ask 100 people and take the two that like you, you yeah. know? Cool. It's completely subjective. Like, I don't know, like the shirt you're wearing right now, you clearly thought that was a good idea. I like the color blue. Right? I yeah. also think it's a good idea, I think you look good. But the dude sitting right in front of you, he might think it's a shitty fucking shirt. You know what I mean? We, we need yeah. to have a much bigger debate around subjectivity and the sheer audacity and politics and insecurities people use to judge creative. Yeah, awesome. Cheers to that, Gary. Cheers. Hey, mate. How are Love you? Love your work. Well, uh, long-time follower. Thank you. Uh, straightforward question, I think. There is a lot of opportunity in this economy and also yes. a lot of distractions. Yes. Uh, as a professional with limited time, trying to figure out where they want to start in business, how do you think I can best focus on how I'm going to make that decision and also where I should start in the way of social media? I think you need to think about the thing that you like the most. Sure. It really, this is, people don't understand, unless you really love what you do, somebody else is going to love it more and outwork you. Yeah, fair advice. Yeah. You know what I mean? I do. Like, and by the way, it didn't seem like it made sense seven years ago to start a podcast around Pokemon, but if you stayed consistent, loved it, and, and inevitably if you were good at it, it's probably, if the number one Pokemon podcast right now could probably make $500,000 a year in, in advertising. It didn't seem right. What you might like the most is buying bottle caps at flea markets. It doesn't seem obvious, but I really believe that's where the internet's going, the long tail of niche interests at enough scale that brands want to tap into that. And so I think the, the hobbies and interests of many in this room is actually their unlock, right? You know, sure. I really believe that. So passion, long-term commitment, Period. and no precedence needs to be set. Correct. Thank you, Gary. Because mainly, like, then there's also, because here's why, it gets into a far more interesting debate. You ended up selling ties instead of starting a footy podcast. The Thai company allowed you to make 213,000 a year when all the profits are done. The footy company let you make 113. Some may say it was the Thai business. I say it's the footy business because you're dramatically happier at 113 and the only thing that you had to do different was not buy dumb shit. That has to be the conversation. And it is not the conversation now. You understand? I do understand. Thank you so much. You got it. Good day, Gary. How are you? How about yourself? Very well. Um, my question is, like everyone in this room, I love to grind and I love to work hard. Okay. How do you know when you're going in the right direction or the wrong you direction? You just... You sure don't. How did you know when you were... I didn't. You just did it. <laughs> I just knew I liked it. And you loved what you did. Loved what I did, right? You know, again, because I always reference her when I'm here, Barbara Longay, who's sitting in row two, who I love very much. When I bought hundreds of cases of Spring Mountain 1995 Red from Barbara Longay in New Jersey in 1997, I didn't know if that was right or wrong, but what I knew now, many years later, is trying to sell something nobody else could sell and the creativity it took me to move those hundreds of cases taught me something that I later used. I don't know what to say. That's a real life story. We both know it. You know what I mean? Yeah. I didn't know, you know, when I launched winelibrary.com, and Barbara will tell you that most of the industry thought it was stupid and that I should have opened a second store because that's what you did. You opened a second store, not a dot com. There was no internet. When I did email, I should have been doing a catalog. When I did Wine Library TV, everybody thought it was stupid or self-serving. I never know. 
Thank you very much. People are not patient. Do you understand? That's why I push it so hard. Yeah. How the, f what do you think, I'm a fucking genie from the future? <laughs> I don't know if it's gonna work. People are scared to lose three or four years of their life. People over, especially kids piss me off. They overvalue their time. They're like, Gary, I don't want to waste time. They're like, your time's not worth dick, asshole. <laughs> it's like free work. People are like, fuck you, Gary. I'm not doing free work. I'm like, cool, get somebody to pay for it. Oh, you couldn't? Now what? Oh, you didn't think that maybe doing free work would give an example to somebody else that then will pay you? You fucking audacious, lazy fuck. You like that one in the back, right? Right? How the fuck are people complaining about doing free work when nobody's fucking paying them? What the fuck? I gave a shitload of free speeches. Not anymore. I know time's up, but I'm gonna try to get a couple more. Namaste, Gary. How are you? I'm good. It means I bow down to you. Thank you. Uh, I started following you since 2015 and I got obsessed with two words, self-awareness and emotional intelligence. Yes. And it was like my dream to become an entrepreneur but after getting obsessed with two words and then I started working on myself and then I have realized that how weak I am to start this journey. Good. And since four years, I'm just working on it. I'm still, I, I know that what my strengths and weaknesses are. So, and a few months ago, even I heard uh, one of your speeches that you were saying that you want to teach American people about two S, sacrifice and saving. Yes. And then I, I started thinking like, okay, I have my spiritual guru as well, but you are my entrepreneurial guru as well as the spiritual guru because I have started my spiritual journey with you as well. Without using a spiritual word, you are spreading spirituality. That's what I have realized because whenever you speak, you speak about humanity, every, everybody. So my question is, so my question is, What's the main role of spirituality in business and as well as as a business personality or any business organization, how we can contribute in the society business as a tool? So I, th I think it's a tremendous observation. I think from my standpoint, it, you know, it's funny, you brought it up. It's about self-awareness, right? Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that, I don't think that people understand how being selfless is such an advantage in business. You know, I don't know what else to say. That's the answer. Like, you know, if you think about spirituality, and I'm not educated enough in it, which is why I don't speak to it, but it's in me, which is why it is obvious, it's going to be based on good shit. Yeah. Like, like, to me, it's like doing the right thing. I think businesses have an incredible opportunity to do the right thing. It's, it's how I see it. I, I believe that I'm on a mission to show the world that you can be a killer who also happens to be a sweetheart. Yes. You know, and so I think that's the role. Especially as governments continue to go in a direction of nationalism and insular vulnerabilities, it's an opportunity for global businesses to make a bigger positive impact. Yeah. And I think we will reward those businesses over the next century. So that's the future we can see that? I'd like it to be true, and I don't know, but I know that if I execute, at least I can create an example. Thanks. Yo, Gary, how, how you doing? How are you? Good, how are you? Super. Um, I want to give you a little bit of context before I ask you the question. You got it. So, I work two part-time jobs. Okay. As well as uh, working freelance okay. as a designer. Okay. Also selling beard oil online. Selling what? Beard oil online. Beard oil. Oil, yeah. Understood. There was a dude with a huge uh, fucking I'm, beard. I'm going to yeah. have a chat to him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or, you know, there's a lot of bearded dudes here. I know. Um, but I'm lucky enough to love what I do. You're liking it? I love what I do. I'm a designer. And awesome. I also work in marketing, so I love it. Okay. Um, what I, I, know the con I know that part of what I have to do is a lot of content. Okay. What I struggle is, is with knowing what to actually do. Just do something. So the you question... Have to Here's where people get caught. I don't know either, but every day you make five pieces of content, you're gonna get a lot of no's. Okay. And over time, you're gonna find some yeses. So you test and try. Go figure. <laughs> Thanks, man. You get it? Yeah. Like, there's no right answer. You know, it might be you just talking. 
It might be a video of somebody applying the beard oil. It might be you interviewing on Skype the person that produces the beard oil. It might be the story of how you got the beard oil. It might be pictures of dudes with huge red beards. Like, I don't fucking know. I just know that you need to do all of them and find the answer. What about, I'm also a graphic designer, so what about as a graphic designer and a creative, what kind of content would you produce as a graphic designer and creative? I would fucking make pictures of people putting beard oil on their fucking beards. Right. Or I would make up a funny mythical tale of if you put this beard oil on your beard, you get to hook up with the prettiest girl in the world or save your mom from a burning building or you would fucking, fucking be creative. Right. Can I take a photo with you? You can. Yep. Can I get one more in? All right, last one. Hey, Gary, how are you? First of all, I wanted to say I fucking love you, man. You're I like love the you best back. on the planet, pretty much. Um, you got me into actualizing my shit. I was in my bedroom, always on my bed, just dreaming away about business idea here and there, and nothing fucking happened. Yep. And then I started moving, built a team, got a couple um, programmers with me from university that are studying on the master's level, and we're getting shit done, we're moving. I just want to know, how do I find the balance between going too hard and going too soft? Because I've always had this problem with I burn myself out because I go way too hard for too long. Is it possible that you were aiming for money? No, I don't give a fuck about money. That's coming later. I'm 18 years old. I got time. So why would you burn out? Because I just go so hard. I don't sleep. Fucking, I sleep stupid hard. (laughs) I'll give you a really good, let me, let me use this opportunity. I sleep six, seven, or eight hours a night. Everyone's like, you only sleep what, three hours? I'm like, no motherfucker, sleep's important. <laughs> so sleep seven or eight hours. Don't get caught up in the bullshit that sleep isn't, like that sleeps for losers or non-entrepreneurs. Like sleep fucking, no wonder you burned out, dick. You gotta sleep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and one more thing, right? If I can, in the next, five to 10 years, build this business up to $5 million plus, would you give me the opportunity to pitch you an investment? Sure. And can I take a photo with you? Yes. I can't read what that says. Can I crew for can you? Can I crew for you? I don't know what crew is. Well, the crew. You mean like do an event? Yeah. Yep, yeah. next time. Okay. Sure. <laughs> sure. Gary, Gary. Email me. Sure, sneak it in real fast. Gary, Gary, um, my, my partner, Grant Cardone, talks about getting your partner on board. If she's not on the same page, it's not going to happen, right? Okay. I want my partner safe. I want her to come join my business. Kangaroo hopping tours. We do sightseeing and winery tours. What is your um, feedback or advice on getting somebody who's safe to come and join me for the unknown journey? To listen to them. Listen to them. Right? I mean, there's so much audacity in entrepreneurs to force their mates, their partners, their spouses on their journey. Yeah. You've got to ask them what they want. Okay. Okay. I I asked that. Yeah. And? Yeah. Yeah. She says. To not do that. (laughs) No, really. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So this is real shit right now. That's why I let you ask the question because relationship stuff is super fascinating to me. Yeah. First entrepreneurs need to have a conversation with their partner about what do they want. Okay. Usually, or often, you can start negotiating give and takes. Sometimes, you can't. You have two very different people. Then you have to have that real conversation. Okay. You know, like, because some entrepreneurs would die if they can't do what they do. 